Very good. All right, welcome online, everybody. We're going to pray, and we'll get started with our science lesson for today. <laughs> okay, God, thank you so much for this time to be together, to, uh, to worship, and to learn together, and to be together, and to share uh, this time as a family. I pray for those who couldn't make it this morning, and be with them, and those who are sick, and help us to grow, and learn, and be challenged to uh, just really... Um, be in awe of your creation again as we talk about uh, your creation and all that you've done. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. So, once again, we will venture into the world of science for this week. And I haven't decided next week if we're going to leave it alone or if I'll do my universe lesson. But we'll, uh, I, I really like the universe lesson, so I'll probably end up doing it. And who knows? This might be the longest series we end up with. I think we're on part 12 total. Anyway, so we're in the part called war with your mind, Satan's war with your mind, how Satan is attacking us, trying to convince us of lies that he has spread throughout the world. And as part of this war with our mind, he has invaded us academically uh, through the scientific community. And we are exposing the foolishness that he has introduced through science. And this is the third part here. Our main premise, of course, is that science is fully compatible with our belief in God and completely contradictory to atheism. And I keep saying this over and over, especially for the kids, so that you guys can understand that science and God can coexist, they do coexist, and they're completely compatible. And anyone who says so or who says otherwise is, as Richard Dawkins would put it, insane, <laughs> to use his own quote against him. But... Because we know that God exists, we can focus on learning how to see him in science and trying to unbrainwash ourselves from the mass media. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very right. Last week, I introduced this, this sort of outline. When you get into a discussion with someone related to proof of God's existence or anything related to science, life, or biology, focus on one thing when you talk. So the first one we dealt with last week, which was the cell, dealing with parts of the cell, DNA, and the fact that there is information there, and where did that come from? Today we're looking at life, which, yes, the cell is life. I'm just talking about bigger life rather than smaller life. So dealing with humans and animals, we'll look at the fossil record today. It's part of what we're dealing with. And then you could also deal with the universe. But between those three things, it pretty much encompasses everything. Everything is encompassed in either microbiology, biology, or if you call it astronomy, or um, there's cosmology, that's the study of the universe, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we know God exists from looking at life? How do we know God exists from looking at life? It's, it's a really interesting question, but this is a question that many scientific uh, disciplines have been invented in order to uh, determine. People go to college and get multiple degrees, lots of PhDs. They get lots of life science education in order to, ter to determine something that we know definitively that it, it was God. We, we know this definitively. And it's, it's just obvious. For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. If there isn't a more clear verse in the Bible that says, look outside, open your eyes, don't be stupid. I mean, that's, that's really what this is saying. It's obvious the eternal power of God, if it isn't unlocked by seeing in, inside a cell like we did last week and the little creatures that walk along your microtubules between your chromosomes and unwrapping a DNA strand, which is almost perfectly copied as it creates the RNAs that go off and make amino acid chains that are perfectly folded into proteins. I mean, if we don't see eternal power in the information in a cell, then good grief, people, what are we looking at? And his divine nature. I think when I look at nature, and, and we aren't even getting into the depth of the, the sort of uh, codependency or it, just the organizational structure of how 
plants provide oxygen and we breathe oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide and, and sunlight, how it makes plants grow. I mean, when we were at Julie's little garden that she made up, you know, and we we go out there and see what God grew, you know, it's like, you just put water on dirt. I mean, there's, there's a little seed in there and just put water. It's not quite that simple. I understand you've got types of nutrients in the, in the soil. And if you have good soil, anyway, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's incredible. And it's organized and it's fascinating to see the intricate nature of God. And that's what we see when we look out and see all the systems in place. Just think about, I didn't even talk about this last week, but of the 20 amino acids in your body, you can only make 11 of them, okay? Those are non-essential amino acids. Of the nine that are essential, you have to eat them in order to live. You cannot create them from other things in your body. Your body can't break down other items and then assemble them to make them. Yet we get those things from the food that we eat. Yet if we were going to evolve through natural selection, it wouldn't make sense for your body's efficiency to be dependent on eating something else in order to create these amino acids. Why stop at 11? Why would natural selection have just made you create all 20 amino acids? Well, because God made us to eat and he made us to exist in this way that is dependent on other things and it creates this perfect balance in, in the world. Anyway, could go on and on about that forever. But when we look at life, we know how it happened from reading Genesis. So let's look at these texts before we get started into the scientific nature of things. Starting in verse 11 of Genesis 1. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. Don't underestimate the and it was so, because God literally spoke it into existence. But if you think about the complexity of life, even the complexity of plants, he's not just drawing a picture. He's coding these elements. He's designing them, coloring them, creating them, and then manufacturing the system that generates it in order for it to be self-replicating. I mean, if you think about the idea of, of reproduction, and the fact that humans can reproduce and have babies, plants can reproduce, animals can reproduce. And you think about humans, have we ever generated anything that's self-replicating? No, we haven't. So God in this, and it was so, in this just simple sentence, does something that is far more advanced and far more intricate and just complex beyond our wildest dreams, something we can't even imagine or understand. And he speaks it into existence. That's how complex his brain, is, his understanding is, if, if you want to put it that way. So don't, don't miss out on what's going on here when God speaks these things into existence. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Pay attention as we look at these texts in Genesis to the word kinds. I didn't get into this because the sermon was already too long, so I had to cut the whole part on kinds. But if you've been to the Ark or the Creation Museum, uh, Ken Ham does a really good job explaining, especially at the Ark exhibit, how kinds, there were less kinds back then. And as kinds, um, meaning the type or the species, if you will, uh, in some books they call them phyla, but as they reproduce, microevolution, which is just slight modifications in species, occur over time. And that's how we get the multiple colored butterflies that we have and all the variation of the horse kind. But none of that is interspecies. None of it is macroevolution. We never see a, a rabbit turning into a horse or anything like that. But what we see from the beginning is that God produced the basic kind of every plant and animal and humankind, which it's, very, it's easiest to understand from humanity's standpoint because you see Asians, Indians, uh, Chinese, um, you know, Jewish people. We all look Mex Hispanic people and then Caucasian and um, like even Eskimo type people all look different. And you're like, look at all these skin tones and all these various facial features and everything. That's, that's what you see as a humankind has evolved 
and to all the diversity that we see in the human race. That happens in every aspect of life, in animals and plants and in all of it. And that's what we see when we see the word kind. Just from Adam and Eve, all the diversity of the human race was able to come from humankind. Same thing happens with animals, same thing happens with plants, so on and so forth. So pay attention when he says kind to understand what he means as that uh, term can be seen in, in life. Okay, now moving on to verse 20. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Now, pay attention as we look at each day of creation. It's very clear that it's a 24-hour period. This is not a thousand years. This is not a million years. There is an evening. There is a morning. There is a day. And he's defining it and he's stating it this way. This is because the seventh day God rested and he's setting a pattern for us to show us how we live, how we are to model or we are to follow his example. And I could get into the whole Sabbath thing and we could get onto a whole nother sermon just on that. But they are literal days and that's what we see in Genesis. Now, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Again, this makes so much sense when you think about the ark and the fact that one of the big arguments from secularism, uh, uh, secularists, is that all the animals today couldn't fit on the ark. And you're like, duh. That's because there weren't that many types of animals. Okay, when you go down to it, there were less people on the earth too. But we all started with Adam and Eve, the same as all of the horse kinds started from two horses. And as the and that just really proves the diversity of DNA in these animals to be able to select different genes that modify, you know, slight features like color and skin tone and eye shape and all the things that give us such great diversity. Okay, then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So finally, also on day six, God created mankind. So also meaning he created all the animals, the land animals and man on day six. So when we see this term mankind, we understand that just from Adam and Eve, all the diversity of humanity came from that. Now, as we go on, how does the Genesis story help us disprove evolution? How do we see what happened in Genesis and also including the flood in Genesis six? There's really, I'm going to be making some broad statements in order for us to actually cover this material in the allotted time that I have. <laughs> because as I go over some of these things, it'll be like, now that was a very big state, like the flood. We're going to deal with the flood and it's going to take like one minute and you're going to be like, okay, I could have, I could have had some more explanation there, but I really didn't want this to drag out over endless amounts of weeks, but I want you to have this information I really want the kids especially to understand foundationally how your faith is verified by science and how we can look at the world and know God exists. Okay, last week I gave you three points. Okay, we haven't gotten to the first blanks yet. That's the next slide. The main points from the DNA cell lesson were information, complexity, and experience. And I kept this acronym ICE to try to help you remember it in some meaningful way. But the basic breakdown of how I would approach it is you bring up a point of information in DNA, you bring up the point of complexity in the cell, and then you ask based on how we see the world today, 
how should we assume that it worked back then? Because science, the best tool we have in science is using what we can observe today to understand how things worked in the past. That, that's the best tool that we get from science. How things work today is how things used to work back then as well. And then, of course, with evolution, it's the complete opposite. It's how things work today is nothing like how things worked back then, which is a great plausible deniability for them to say, that's why we can't observe it. Because we can't observe it because it happened completely differently than it does now. Whereas us and our logical, rational minds say, we are observing exactly today everything that has ever happened in all of creation because it's happening the same today as it always has. Mama, dada, baby. That's how it happens. Okay? Yeah. Chicken, chicken, egg. Like, mommy chicken, daddy chicken, baby chicken. Okay? That's how it works. That's how it's always worked. They're like, no, it started with soup. We'll get to the soup in a second. So today, as we deal with life, these are the three main points. If you get into this discussion with people about evolution and biology, this is what you want to understand and remember. Three things. Number one, in the beginning. Number two, Cambrian fossils. And number three, experience. So this is great because we're keeping the same format using this as a memory tool for you to have intelligent discussions with people who might be atheist or evolutionary biologists or whatever. We're gonna deal mostly within the beginning. I'll deal a little bit with the technical details of the Cambrian explosion. And it's hard to deal with it and call it Cambrian explosion because Cambrian specifically deals with a period of time between 550 to 530 million years ago. And we do not believe in long earth timing. We believe in a young earth of 6,000 years. But the flood, this is one of those broad overarching statements that includes like <laughs> thousands and thousands of hours of research and way more stuff than I have the time to explain. But the flood completely accounts for the t dating uh, misunderstanding of science. And you're like, just take your word for it. Yes, just take my word for it. You can do all the research. Actually, the Creation Museum has some good um, explanations on that. Moving on, moving on. Let's keep going. Number one, begin at the beginning. Okay. Th this is what I mean when I say start at the beginning. Okay. You pose this question to anyone. Okay. And it will completely dissolve their entire worldview. Everyone's worldview has to start somewhere. You have the creation worldview and you have the secular worldview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dietrich understands like that there was a beginning to his life. He's saying right now, yes, I had a beginning. I was nothing at some point and then I was something. I, I, uh, it's a beginning. The secularist has no answer to this question. Okay, let that sink in for a second. Secular science, you call it naturalism, call it materialism, put them together and call it materialistic naturalism, call it Darwinian evolution, call it whatever you want, but they have no answer to this question, none. So this question dissolves the secular worldview almost instantaneously, except they'll use a lot of words and try to get out of it and confuse you into utter oblivion to where you're like, what did you just say? And at the end of the day, they say nothing, nothing of value to this question. We'll explain. Now, we have the creation worldview versus the evolution worldview on the beginning. And there should not be a period there that is not a sentence. Nevertheless, I have my title text here. That's interesting. Okay. Oh, that's because I didn't delete my text box. I put, I put this chart up on this slide and there was a text box behind it. So now you're getting to see my text box behind my chart. So here's the difference between the creation and evolution worldview. First, in the beginning, creation says God. Evolution says soup. You can just leave it at that. It's called prebiotic soup. It, I know, I know, it's sort of funny. We're like, really? It does. It's not, in the beginning, there was soup. And that's what they believe, okay? The problem with that is that's not a good answer. They will present it as if it was a good answer, but basically what they're saying is there was some stuff that was always there. And we're supposed to accept that. There was stuff and it was always there. 
I'm having a hard time swallowing that <laughs> soup. Next, creation says God created everything. Evolution says soup mixed itself into stuff. Okay? That's exactly what they say. There was soup. And over time, and it, you can refer to it technically, some people call it the RNA world. Some people think that RNA existed before DNA and that the whole world existed of multiple strands, I think it's millions or billions, whatever, of RNA that self-assembled retroactively, meaning that DNA now comes before RNA, but somehow RNA started it and then retroactively created DNA, which then created the RNA that existed before it. Not buying that either. That makes no sense, okay? Anyway, we have a beginning of a pre-existent being with intelligence that can do things. They have a pre-existent thing that did things without intelligence and somehow created things that were there bef that should have created itself. It, it should have somehow, well, where did the, where did the stuff come from that, yeah, see, from? That's, that's the problem when you start to talk through this. God didn't create himself. And the things that God is are not the things that we have now. God created things outside himself and still exists outside of the things that he created over and above and in control of. The soup existed and then doesn't exist because it recreated itself into something that it wasn't, but it now is. Yeah, makes no sense. It's like bab babbling. Now, creation, we have a definitive time based on scripture. It took six days to create everything. Evolution says three to four billion years. I end up saying three and a half billion years because that's, that's a general estimate. I did read some articles this week that are on the four billion year timeline. Other people lend lean towards the three billion years but as we discussed last week it would take more than a trillion trillion should be seven, trillion 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 years to assemble one protein randomly that's how long it would take and that's if you hit the nail on the head once in seven not seven trillion but we're talking 12 zeros of a trillion lined up seven times is how many chances you would need to make one protein. And we showed that we need 160 just to copy one DNA strand and a cell has thousands of proteins. So this timeline falls short by a factor of a lot, a whole lot. Now, next, okay, we get to the, to the last point. Creation says life continues as designed. Life continues just like it was designed. Things happen just like they've always happened. Evolution says, now everything is different. Well, why do they have to say that? Well, because the soup doesn't exist anymore. Somehow this pre-existent soup became the most complex interdependent structure that we've ever seen in our entire lives. And at some point it reached a stasis or a repetitive form and it doesn't need to evolve anymore, which again is self-contradictory. How could something that evolved in such a short period of time into something so complex all of a sudden stop evolving? Okay, it's like, it's like a ball that's rolling down the hill and it's still on the hill, but somehow the ball stops. And that's again another reason, another thing the tree of life can't explain is that we aren't seeing any new speciation. We aren't seeing any, any half species animals today. Everything is perfectly defined in every class, every phyla, every species is perfectly defined and separate. Yet you're telling me for billions of years this ball was rolling down the hill and then all of a sudden in our lifetime it stopped. And when I say our lifetime, I mean in the, in the traceable history of mankind, it stopped. Really. It's like shooting a bullet and expecting it just to pause in midair long enough for us to stop and analyze everything and say, look, nothing's happening. But it has happened. No, okay. Now, let's keep going. What was in the beginning? Was it God or was it soup? Now, why is this the question that has to be asked? It has to be asked because we have to have a beginning. There has to be a beginning. 
And the huge problem with evolution is that they never go back to the beginning. They never tell us where the soup came from. And it, it, it just, you, it, there's, again, there's just no explanation for it. So here's, here's the fact. The fact is something or someone must be pre-existent, all existing and eternal. Why is this a problem? This is a problem because of the definition of the term eternal or infinite. And as you start to study infinity, you'll start to understand the absolute absurdity of saying that the soup was infinite. Because if the soup is infinite, then it would still be there. Okay? If the soup was pre-existent and it existed forever, it would still be there and it would still be exactly like how it was because it would never change for it to be infinite. For something to change, it has to have a beginning in order for it to progress from the beginning to a presupposed or, or some sort of projected end. The reason why God makes more sense than soup is because God is the same today as he was back then and he's always been the same and he always will be the same. That's what eternal means. So by saying that something is pre-existent or eternal, you are by definition stating that there is a God. You cannot say that something is pre-existent or eternal if it doesn't exist today. And the soup doesn't exist. It's not there. There, There's no soup anywhere that we're going to go observe. I mean, seriously, though, if we could go out into the galaxy and find this pool of prebiotic soup and could analyze it and see that it was spitting out RNA and proteins just randomly like billions and billions of them a second and observe them sending out galaxies and planets and stuff into the atmosphere, then we could know. Yeah, okay, there it is. We can go out and see it. It's happening just the way it's always had. That eternal soup is still there. It's still generating universes and people. In fact, there actually is a theory of the metaverse, not talking Marvel metaverse. There is an actual scientific called the multiverse. Sorry, I said metaverse. That's Facebook. But um, the multiverse is actually a scientific theory that there is a universe generating machine that we can't see that's generating universes. And so that there are millions of universes that exist the size of ours, which is really big. And ours just happened to be the one that got lucky enough to have life occur in it. But where did that machine come from? Who, st- who created the machine? I mean, the machine is pre-existent, so they, so they start creating these things that function like a god, but they won't admit that there's a god. So again, for something to be eternal, it has to exist always and forever, and their soup doesn't, which means it had a beginning, which means that someone had to make it, and of course there's no soup, there's just us. Which is why the scripture says, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Okay, underneath what? Underneath everything. So if you picture the expanse of the universe, God's holding it up. God's holding the universe in his hands. You know, we can measure the universe in the breadth of his hand. We know that God is is eternal because something has to be eternal in order for there to be a beginning. Something had to be pre-existent before it, which means that it has to always exist, which is the definition of God. He is eternal. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. Isaiah 26, 4. We trust in him because he is eternal. That's why we have, and if you think about it, it makes perfect sense when you start to look at the laws of physics that are measurable and repeatable over and over and over again, like gravity You look at the solar system and you look at orbits and you look at things like that and you say, well, how is it that the sun always rises in the same place and sets in the same place year after year after year? How can we project what the moon phases are going to be like years into the future where you could type into Google what moon phase will happen on this day on my 50th birthday? And they'll say it'll look just like this. How do you know that? If we're all just a random mess, then how do you know that the moon isn't going to just crash into earth next year? And if you look at some scientists, they're like, there's an asteroid, it's going to hit the earth in 10 years. They've been saying that for 10 years, for, for years and years and years. There's an asteroid out there. But God designed the solar system with the bigger planets out there, like Jupiter and Saturn. They're actually asteroid vacuums, that their gravity is so strong, they actually pull the asteroids away from the earth so that nothing ever hits us. It's brilliant. 
It's like someone designed it that way. Cosmic vacuums out there sucking up asteroids so that we can have life on earth consistently. Anyway, Jeremiah 10.10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. It's powerful to, to bow down and to, to think about, to humble ourselves and to think about this all-existing eternal God who created us and rules over the earth and holds it all together in perfect balance. That's the only way this makes sense. Randomness would not create order, would not create laws of physics. Math would not exist without God. Because one day you would wake up and 2 plus 2 would be 5. The next day you would wake up and 2 plus 2 would be 7.36149. And then the next day 2 plus 2 might be 4 if you're lucky. But because there's a God, every day you wake up and 2 plus 2 is 4. And you could take that to the bank every day. Because there's a God, there is order. Randomness would not produce such order. Now, don't be afraid to ask the tough questions when we get into these conversations. Don't be afraid to ask where the soup came from. Where did the soup come from? And they'll say, it was pre-existent, it's all existing. And then you'll say, well, where is it today? And they'll say, oh, well, I guess it's not all existing because it doesn't exist anymore. So where is it? it, uh, it, it, uh, it well, it was, but now it, 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 it evolved. Okay, well then show me this process of evolution still occurring today. Well, look out, all the variations of plants and look at the, like Darwin, the finch. Look at the beaks of the finch. And you'd say, that's called microevolution. That's called interspeciation. That's called variation. That's not called the big E evolution. And they'd be like, well, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so ask them where the bang came from. When they say everything started with a big bang. Okay, so you could tell them, next time you're out in a large open space, grab a pile of rocks and throw them out onto a basketball court, okay? And then study the array that you've created on the basketball court and compare it to the universe and see if you see any order on the pile of rocks that you threw out onto the basketball court compared to what you see in the universe, which if we get, well, we will. I'll deal with the universe next week, but... The flatness of the universe, the fact that the universe is flat, disproves the fact that something went bang, because when something goes bang in space, it goes in all directions, and our universe is flat, and it's equally spaced. You never see clumps of universes together. When you see a universe, they're always spaced out. They're never clumped randomly, and the temperature of the universe is the same throughout, which is uh, CMBR, cosmic, micro, uh, cosmic background radiation, CMBR, there's an M in there somewhere, cosmic micro radiation, background radiation, that's what it is. Anyway, I'll, I'll, it's just great. It's like, well, why is the temperature the same? If there was a big bang, then the temperature wouldn't have had time to spread across the universe and it'd all be the same within like a tenth of a degree. But if it was designed that way, then hey, guess what? RNA world people, oh, it all started with RNA. Well, where did RNA come from and where did the information come from in that? Any, anything they say, just ask them where it came from. It's very simple. They'll say this, and you'll say, where did it come from? Oh, this, where did that come from? And you'll get down to soup, and that's what you're left with. Or where did the information in DNA come from? Where did the information in the cell come from? When we see the Cambrian explosion here in a minute, and we see that all of these body plans of animals just appeared out of nowhere, all of these animals, every species that we see on Earth today, have been found in the Cambrian explosion during the same time period all at once, as if there was a global catastrophic event that buried every type of animal at the same time in the same fossil layer. As if. And you're like, where did all these animals come from? So, when science speaks, pay attention, they're probably lying to you. All you have to do is pay attention. Literally, all you have to do is have some semblance of analytical thinking or critical thinking skills to dismantle the PhD evolutionary biologist Darwinian naturalistic materialistic person. All you have to do is think with the brain God gave you and ask them reasonable questions to disprove these in really incredibly stupid people. 
How do they lie to us? Well, this is what I've been saying. This is sort of where we need to unpack this just a little bit. The word presupposition, that's where the soup came from. It was presupposed. That's a thing tacitly assumed or just automatically assumed beforehand at the beginning of a line of argument or course of action. So notice the point that we're making is called in the beginning. Now, a presupposition is that they just assume something was there in the beginning. They just assume something was there. But like I've told you, if there was something there in the beginning that was eternal, it needs to be there now. The only thing that fits that qualification is God, but they will assume all kinds of things present in the beginning, things that could not have been there by themselves. Like if you walk into a house, okay, let's say there was a, a new construction build, okay, the house was just built, no one's ever lived in it, there's a street sign on the yard, new construction, come in and tour the house, and you come in. There's a cereal bowl in the sink with milk and some soggy cereal and a spoon in the sink. It's always been there. You, you walk in and you say, who, who would walk into this house? They would say, this house has never been lived in. That's a fact. It's never been lived in. New construction, fact. There's no furniture, nothing but the cereal bowl in the sink. It's always been there. It must have come with the sink. In fact, when they installed the sink, there must have been a cereal bowl in the sink with milk and, and cereal in it. And when they manufactured the sink, they manufactured the cereal bowl and the cereal and the milk and the spoon. And when they installed the sink, the cereal bowl was there. It was just always there. There's your prebiotic soup. Then you come back 100 years later and there's furniture in the house and clothes in the closet. And you say, well, that cereal bowl generated all of that furniture. And from that cereal bowl came all the clothes. Or somebody put it there. No, no, no. There can't be someone there because we know that house has never been lived in. Or the person selling you it. Or the real estate agent had some cereal and left their bowl in the sink. No. <laughs> Maybe they're just trying to make it look new. <laughs> Maybe they're lying to you. Maybe, maybe they're lying to you. A presupposition. It's, uh, it's assuming something. Okay? That's, that's what we have. So in every argument for evolution, presuppositions are present in the beginning. Presuppositions. That means that they put something there and then they start their argument. Their argument never starts in the beginning. It starts after something else happened that they can't explain. So these are the main presuppositions of evolution. The first one is the biggest, and that's called materialism. Their presupposition or their assumption, their main assumption about life is that everything has a material explanation. Everything has a natural cause and explanation. That's called materialism, and this is what science has become. In fact, it's become so prevalent because of Darwin that scientists define science as if it were the same thing as materialism, and it's not. Science and materialism are not the same thing, yet science tells us that if it's going to be scientific, it has to have a material cause and a natural explanation. Well, that's just ridiculous. In Darwin's Doubt, the book that I'm referencing for the material in this lesson, Stephen Meyer quotes, Methodological naturalism asserts that to qualify as scientific, a theory must explain phenomenon and events in nature, even events such as the origin of the universe and life, or phenomena such as human consciousness by reference to strictly material causes. According to this principle, scientists may not invoke the activity of a mind, or as one philosopher of science puts it, any creative intelligence. So what they've done, what science has done by defining science and materialism as the same thing, or starting from the presupposition that everything has a natural cause, they're saying that we cannot use God as an explanation. Can't. And because of that, they have to create other things. So materialism is a lie, for one, because in the beginning, something had to start it all. And just because something continues to happen without intervention does not mean it has always happened without intervention. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you walk into a factory that's fully automated, Okay, let's say it's making candy bars. 
In fact, I love watching how it's made videos. One I watched recently was how Kit Kat bars are made. It's fascinating. The, in fact, in the entire video, I never saw a human being. I saw a machine generating Kit Kat bars all by itself, literally. No. no people in the video at all. The machine just runs. So I'm guessing that machine has always run and it's been there forever, eternally, creating Kit Kat bars because Kit Kat bars are the eternal chocolate of mankind. <laughs> but that's exactly what science does. They look at something and they say, well, it, it's happened. It, there's, there's no, there's, it's only materialistic. It's all natural. Um, we see nature doing this, like gravity, but they don't ask, well, how did, how did gravity get set? How did that metric begin? It means that we cannot always have a natural explanation for science. So our experience about materialism, this is how we go through this train of thought. In the beginning, Cambrian fossils experience. So we take our experience and we apply them to those two points. Well, our experience about materialism tells us that everything has a beginning. We see that everything has to be, we can look out and see that tree and say that tree started from a seed and then it grew into a tree. This house, someone came along and built it. We came from a mommy and a daddy. Everything has a beginning. Okay. That's what our experience tells us about materialism. The second presupposition is information. This deals with last week, so I'm not going to get into it a lot, but it applies the same with biology. Specified data exists without any reasoning or explanation. Science cannot explain where the data came from. When we look at the Cambrian fossils and all the body plans, science cannot explain where they came from. They can just make presuppositions about a common ancestor of all the animals. Same with DNA. They don't know. They cannot explain where the information originated. Why? Because only intelligence produces information. Materialism does not equal intelligence. And remember the quote I just read you from Stephen Meyer's book, quoting materialism saying we cannot, cannot say it was a mind. We can't. That's the rule. Well, who created the rule? I did. I created the rule that I can't say it was God. So I can't say it was God. So it was something else. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, the last presupposition is knowledge. This is the one we'll deal with here for just a minute. Natural selection understands what is better and works toward that specific goal. Okay, this is, this is fascinating, folks. If, if you haven't stopped to think about this, this, again, completely breaks down the whole idea of natural selection. Because when Darwin is thinking of natural selection and looking at how animals evolve, his presupposition is that only the fit survive, the strongest survive, meaning the ones with preferred traits, the ones who are better. The better ones live, the weaker ones die. Now, when we look at animals that have, we look out at the world and how the world works and we see, oh, there's a food chain. These stronger animals kill the weaker animals and eat them. And those animals kill these weaker animals and eat them. And we look at the way the world is designed. We see that. We see the fit survive. But then we go back before that to organisms, DNA, things that don't have minds or consciousness or natures. And we say, well, how did that protein evolve into an eye? How did it know that it needed to be an eye? Okay, let me illustrate. Let me illustrate. This, this is great, okay? I'm going to show you four choices. And you're going to pick which one is better. So we're going to play the role of natural selection. I'm going to give you four things, and you're going to pick which one is better. And we're going to illustrate how natural selection works. First, four score and seven years ago. It's the first choice. Okay? Now, just wait. It'll make sense when you see all four choices. We're trying to pick which one is better. Okay? And I'm illustrating this from the standpoint of if we had a bunch of parts that are just thrown out on the floor and we're gonna pick one that's better than the others. Okay, next, B. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That says four, it should say far. I can't type. So now we have two choices. I wonder which, which one is better. Ignore my typo, it should say far. How about this one? 
C, when in the course of human events? Okay, that, that's, that's a good statement. I like that. How about choice D? Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, private drive. Privet. Privet. Privet drive. Which one's better? D. Okay, D is better. A. A, A is better? A. You like A? Why not? It should make sense. You should know which one is better. Because that's how natural selection works. It knows which one is better. You should know which one is better. You can't. You can't know, can you? Because you don't know what we're doing. You don't know the objective. If I said the objective was to write Harry Potter, which one would be better? D. Then we would write Harry Potter. Now, what about if we were to write the Declaration of Independence? Which one starts the Declaration of Independence? C does. So if I knew I was going to build a human body, then I would know which one to pick. But if I was going to build, let's say, a lion or a tree, well, that would be a completely different choice. But I'd have to know ahead of time which one I was building in order for it to be correct. Like if I was going to uh, go see a movie. If I, it, let's, let's just be really generic. Let's say I'm going to go see a movie. Which one would be the one to build a movie out of? B. That's how Star Wars begins. So if I was going to make a movie, I would start with B. But what if I was going to speak the Gettysburg Address and I was Abraham Lincoln? A. Then I would use A. So depending on what I'm building completely determines which one is better. But somehow natural selection randomly selects what's better without any foreknowledge of what it's building. Do you see the ridiculous nature of that argument? It, it makes no sense. You don't know what is better unless you know what you are making. This is the biggest presupposition of evolution, is that somehow this mindless, remember, you cannot invoke a mind. Mindlessness with knowledge. Mindless evolution with knowledge is a contradiction. These, these, these things are evolving into shapes and creatures perfectly suited for life, yet they're just picking something that's better without knowing where it's going. This is the most obvious lie of natural selection, is that it has an understanding of how to select better variations. That is the most obvious, blatant, foolish lie that science is trying to pull over on us, is that somehow... This random process is able to determine what is better, and it can't. Our experience tells us that only an intelligence can analyze and naturally select positive improvements on a given system. It's the only way. It's like me going into the Kit Kat factory and deciding I'm going to improve the machine, but without any knowledge of the machine whatsoever. Hey, buddy. Without any knowledge of the machine whatsoever, I just go in and start changing things. And I say to the Kit Kat engineer who designed the machine, don't worry, I'm going to make it better. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm going to make it better. What are you going to do? I'm going to make it run faster. So I turn the speed up and the whole machine overheats and breaks down and, and it crashes and all the Kit Kats are ruined. And he goes, well, that didn't work, did it? And I'm like, no. I said, why didn't it work? He goes, because I designed it to operate at this speed. You can't just make random changes to my machine and expect it to get better. You have to know what you're doing. And I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense. So what happened in the beginning? The only reasonable answer is that God was there to start the process. How did the Kit Kat machine get going? Someone built it, designed it, and started it. They pushed the start button. And every once in a while, they push the stop button and fix things on it and do maintenance on it. And then they start it back up again. We look out at the world and we see the universe spinning with perfect balance, with gravity holding the, the planets in perfect order, and we just assume that something randomly shot them all out into space, and somehow they ended up in perfect orbits that don't collide and are equidistant, or not equidistant, but sp specified distances away. And we just assume that, that somehow natural selection chose the Earth's location when if we move even one 
hundred or it's a thousandth of a percent closer or farther from the sun, we all die. Again, remember these main points. In the beginning, Cambrian fossils and experience. So let's deal with the Cambrian fossils and we'll be done. This should hopefully go much quicker now that I've set up the whole premise and the foundation of presuppositions. This was Darwin's tree of life. This was what he drew in his book, The Origin of... <laughs> Apparently, my program does not like Darwin. It decided I've never had it crash. That's really crazy. It crashed as soon as I put up Darwin's Tree of Life. Yeah, that's crazy. All right, let's go to Tree of Life. Here we go. Darwin's Tree of Life. Let's see if it crashes again. Who knows? Okay, Darwin's Tree of Life. This is what he assumed happened. This is where it all started. He said, well, I see these animals up here. These have similarities. These have similarities. These have similarities. So they look similar to these animals, and those look similar to those animals. And if I go down far enough... Eventually, I'll get to the bottom where there's one common ancestor. This was Haeckel's tree of life. He, he advanced the art a little bit, labeled it with actual names and species. This is by Ernst Haeckel and was drawn in 1866, just at the beginning of the demise of humanity. And he says here, and it's all in Latin, and it's, it's just a bunch of words, common ancestor. This is where it began. Then we break off into plants organisms or bacteria, uh, eukaryotes and prokaryotes, I believe, fits in this middle tree, and then animals, okay? So plants, animals, all of it had a common ancestor. It's nuts. So move up the tree, go up to the very top. <laughs> I know, why don't plants have consciousness? Because if we evolved into consciousness, why didn't they evolve into consciousness too? It'd be so cool to talk to a tree. Be like, hey, tree, what's going on? Like, I don't have a mouth, I can't talk. But you have consciousness, anyway. So this is just a, a general view of what they believe happened, just to get you in the mindset of what the tree of life looks like. Then we end up here with vertebrate animals and more advanced plants and bacteria and sponges and all that good stuff. So does the fossil record support this? What is the fossil record? It is a record of fossils. See, we're getting really advanced. We're all like... <laughs> We're, we're, we're getting there. Now, the question is, does the fossil record prove evolution? And the answer is no, it does not. Okay, and evolutionists have to admit this fact, but they have to admit it with a, an exception where they say the fossil record isn't complete. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So this is a chart of the actual plotting of all the fossils that we have. So the vertical lines in these diagrams represent known animal phyla, or species. The dots within the vertical lines represent animals from those phyla that have been found fossilized in different strata, or different layers of the earth. The diagram on the left shows the animal tree of life as expected based upon Darwinian theory. The diagram on the right shows a simplified representation of the actual pattern of pre-Cambrian Cambrian fossil record. Notice that the fossils representing the internal branches and nodes, but not the terminal branches, are missing. Basically, pay attention to the question marks. The question marks are all of the fossils that we need to have to prove evolution. We have none of them. Never have we found an intermediate species fossil. Never. Every fossil that we found fits perfectly into an already known species. Every single one, without fail, every single time fits into a species. So we fill the tree of life out and it stops right before the branches connect every time. All of the transitional stages of evolution are missing. All of them. Every single one. So what happens is that the evolutionist says, we just don't have all of the fossils yet. Well, that's a pretty, pretty clever argument. We just haven't found them yet. So we've been digging in the earth for 150 years, give or take. And we haven't found a single transitional fossil. We just aren't looking in the right places. I'm not buying it. Not buying it. Okay? And neither do educated people. Okay? It's not just me. So when we ask, is the fossil record complete, we'll look at two different quotes. I'll quote from a secular source called Britannica. The Encyclopedia Britannica states this. The fossil record is incomplete. 
Of the small proportion of organisms preserved as fossils, only a tiny fraction have been recovered and studied by paleontologists. In some cases, the succession of forms over time has been reconstructed in detail. Now, what do we have here? This is a blatant, flat-out lie. Absolute lie. We do not have interspeciation succession, okay? And we do not have it in detail. One example is the evolution of the horse. The horse can be traced to an animal the size of a dog, having several toes on each foot and teeth appropriate for browsing. This animal, called the dawn horse, lived more than 50 million years ago. The most recent form, the modern horse, is much larger in size, is one-toed, has the teeth appropriate for grazing. That's really interesting. The fossil we have looks nothing like the fossils that we have now that are a horse, but somehow these fossils prove that the horse evolved from a dog. Yet they're not alike in any way. The transitional forms are well preserved as fossils. No, they're not. You can read this and take their word for it, or you can go look and see if the fossils are there, and they're not. We have no transitional fossils. As are many other kinds of extinct horses that evolved in different directions and left no living descendants. Oh, they left no living descendants. Okay, that's interesting. I don't know what that means, but somehow that means we haven't found their fossils. How about Stephen Jay Gould, an evolutionist, who says all paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Interesting. So we have this PhD, I believe, evolutionist who just contradicted the Encyclopedia Britannica, but they're both evolutionists. One says we have a bunch of transitional fossils, and he says we have precious little, meaning none. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. What does that mean? It means that of the species we have, they're very clearly defined. Gradualists usually extract themselves from this dilemma by invoking the extreme imperfection of the fossil record. So this evolutionist is even saying that people who believe in the gradual change of species say that the fossil record is imperfect, that we don't have it. Another quote, through her, through her this is a creationist, through her comprehensive examinations of live dead comparisons, Susan Kidwell showed the fossil record contains a high fidelity record of species, richness, and especially abundance, a pattern both unexpected and most welcome. Meaning that her study of the amount of fossils that we found compared to the number of living creatures, that it matches that we found a representation of every creature we believe to have ever lived fossilized. That makes sense. All the animals that live today died at one point and we found their fossils. It's really interesting, all the animals that we don't know lived, we haven't found their fossils yet. <laughs> there are these animals that lived, we just haven't found their fossils yet. So guys, yes, the fossil record is complete. S Stephen Meyer in his book, if you want to read Darwin's Doubt, he goes into extensive detail describing why we believe the fossil record is complete, but this is one of my overarching statements I don't have time to unpack, but the fossil record is complete and there are no transitional fossils. Everything we find and are still finding today affirms everything we have already found. He goes into detail saying that people are becoming creationists because of the fossil record and the data that they're discovering. He goes into detail on a Chinese paleontologist who was an evolutionist until he found this set of fossils that was so old and told us exactly what we already know that he said there's really no way that any of this evolution stuff could have happened because we would have found evidence of it by now. And then he said, well, there you go. Now, to illustrate this in a picture form, look at this. We have a persistent morphological or shape isolation of technological systems. Meaning in the world today, this is how cars have evolved. This would be called microevolution. The form of the car evolved from a Model T to like a Corvette. It's still a car, still functions like a car, it would still be called a car. Okay, that would be like a lion or a horse. The horse from back then was a kind. God created its kind the same way that Henry Ford created a kind of car that is still a kind of car today. Same way with airplanes. The first airplane built or flown by the Wright brothers, I don't know if they actually built it, so don't correct me if my history is wrong on aviation, but nevertheless, airplanes today, even like an F-18 or whatever this might be, it's still an airplane. And it's a kind. So when we look at kinds, we say, what kind of vehicle or transportation is that? And you'd say, it's a plane, it's an airplane, or a jet, or a plane, or a, a passenger plane, it's a plane. 
What is that? It's a vehicle. It's a, it's a ground vehicle. It's a car. But they're the same. These are the same, same kind. Okay? The same thing has happened in the fossil record. We look back at the Cambrian explosion, what they say is 530 million years ago, which we know happened 4,500 years ago from the mass catastrophic event called the flood. And we see that's the phylum called... Thank you. Thank you, someone who took biology. And then we have this cord... Chordata. Chordata, yes. And we see that the kind has changed, but the disparity or the difference in the kinds has always been there. That kind has always been that kind. This kind has always been this kind. So when we look at the fossil record and we see what they think happened, when we plot it correctly over the different pre-Cambrian, okay, that line shows the Cambrian explosion. And then we have all of these species that exist. We see it's very obvious that evolution did not happen. So the fossil record provides absolutely no evidence for evolution between species. No evidence. Now, what we do to end this thought is we ask ourselves this question. What does our experience tell us? There's another typo. I was doing this way. Actually, I was writing my sermon at 9 in the morning, which I never do. That's why there are so many mistakes. Because I usually write it like at 2 or 3 in the afternoon after I've been awake for a little while. Anyway, what does our experience tell us about what the fossil record shows? When we look at the fossil record and we just ask simple questions, simple questions, let's just think. Well, we think it says exactly what it says, okay? So when we look, and this is sort of adding some more information to this question, but let, let's look at this idea real quick. Soft body fossils are created only when preserved rapidly, okay? This should have probably been before that slide, that slide should have come after this one, but nevertheless, when we look at the fossil record and we see how fossils are made, <laughs> we understand that for a creature to be preserved with tissue, organs, or soft parts, it has to be buried rapidly. This is the quote. The animal is likely to be fossilized only if it is buried soon after it dies or when it is buried alive. This is from AmericanGeosciences.org, which basically validates the premise of the flood. What we found in the Cambrian explosion is animals eating other animals, animals with soft parts being preserved. And we know that they could not have died and just laid on the ground because other animals would come along and eat them. That's why we usually, animals that died and were available for predators, we only have bones. But in the Cambrian explosion, we have a lot of soft-bodied animals. And it tells us from our experience that the only way we could have soft body animals is if they die alive, okay? What this reveals from our experience is that every kind of animal was alive during a worldwide catastrophic event. That's what it tells us. So when we look at the Cambrian explosion, science tries to date it at 530 million years. We know factually had to be a worldwide catastrophic event and that their dating system is flawed and it was during the flood. So. When you get into this discussion with everyone or anyone, remember, in the beginning, they will presuppose stuff in the beginning that they say is eternal. We know only God is eternal. We look at the Cambrian fossils and that explosion of data that states very specifically everything we see today, we saw back then. The kinds are a little bit different. We have F-18s and Corvettes now, whereas they only had propeller planes and Model T Fords 500 million years ago. I know, it's crazy how technology has changed in half a billion years. But we look at our experience and say that everything we see happening today is the way it's always happened. And that's because God saw that, all, saw all that he has made and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and earth were completed in all their vast array. Meaning that from the beginning of creation, what we see is the same structure that God made 6,000 years ago. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. The end. Brooklyn, if you'll get ready to stop that after we pray, that would be great. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for our time together this morning to look at the evidence of your creation 
and how everything that we see verifies what your word says, because we know your word is true and flawless. We know you are eternal and that your intelligence has given us insight into more of who you are and how amazingly powerful and eternal you are in your nature. And, and we just, when we look at the, at the creation and the work of your hands, just to know that you're mindful of us, that you love us and that you are watching over us, gives us peace and we rejoice in that. And thank you for all the things that you've done in creation that display the work of your hands. Bless us now and as we go from here, we pray all this in Christ's name, amen. Thank you. All right.